Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Thank you guys for coming today for our grand rounds uh, at the end of the summer. Hopefully, we have but today we're uh, continuing our case conversation. It's been a while since we actually had this, uh, but we're getting back on track. And so today, Annie will be presenting an interesting case. I don't know if it's Netflix, Netflixable. Uh, oh, but there's should, a reason that's not. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> keep uh, keep but we'll keep looking for cases for on Netflix, hopefully. But otherwise, I think Annie will continue with the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Great. So, um, <laughs> I think uh, a couple months ago I gave a conference about um, just sort of concepts of medical education and I introduced some terminology that's being used a lot in the medical school. So I thought it would it might be fun to sort of um, actually navigate through a fairly rare diagnosis that I encountered on the wards recently, um, or a patient with a rare diagnosis, and then uh, to actually look at it through the lens of, of those concepts, uh, just as a little refresher. Um, so just a little roadmap here. Um, we're going to uh, actually finish up my portion in the first 30 minutes or so. Um, so we're just going to review some of the core concepts of clinical reasoning. And um, I mentioned this last time, but there are so many different ways to go about uh, working with learners who are trying to improve their clinical reasoning. And so this is just one way. Um, then we'll navigate the case. Uh, so this is, like I said, directly from the words. Um, using that same vocabulary, and there'll be some interactive portions of the presentation where you guys will be talking to each other about how you would work through this in real time. And then we'll just talk a little bit to kind of build our own fund of knowledge about this diagnosis. So um, just a little plug. I talk about this stuff a lot, but actually I didn't make any of it up. So all of it comes pretty much from this book, Teaching the Hostel by Jeff Lee. So he's a fairly um, influential attending at Tulane, who does a lot in the space of clinical reasoning. Um, and so we're going to talk about three concepts. So, and hopefully these will be familiar from the last time. But so we'll talk about what an illness script is, what a problem representation is, and then what a diagnostic schema is, and think about how we can apply those as we're uh, teaching learners to go through clinical cases. So the first is for illness script. Um, so I wonder if anyone remembers kind of my plug for illness script. If anybody was, I'm not sure who was here at the last presentation. So if you remember what I, this is what I tell people on my team all the time. You should imagine the illness as a movie. So uh, the way I think about this is sort of, um, Jacqueline, what's your favorite movie? Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Yeah, so how do you know, like if you're flipping channels and you're at home, and you flip past Forrest Gump, how do you know it's Forrest Gump? What tells you that? His voice, so how he sounds. What else? The character. The character. Yeah, people will say the music, the background. Often it's like if you flip through it one part of the movie, you know, like, oh, man, I shouldn't watch because it's the last five minutes as opposed to if it's right at the beginning and you can really settle in. So that's the way I think of it, too, is just think about how you know, how you, you understand your favorite movie and how you can recognize each part of it. And what I always say to teams is, that's how we should think about illnesses. And so what we are actually seeing is that like flipping through as you're flipping through the channels and you catch the person at a single instant in time and then we have to have good enough pattern recognition to actually be able to say, oh, that, that flash that I see activates for me like the illness script of a particular disease. Um, and we'll talk a little bit um, about like what constitutes an illness script. So the way that I think about it is like, what do you know about your favorite movie? For people who are really into like Lord of the Rings, they know where it was shot and how it was produced. So they know how it was made. And that's kind of like advanced knowledge, but that's like the pathophysiology of that disease. Who's in it, who watches it, right? So like Forrest Gump, maybe there's a particular population of people who watch and a particular population who don't. Often the med students on the wards will tell me like, oh, my favorite movie is Mean Girls. Like I can tell you, I tried to watch that with my mom once and she was not into it. So like, watch the block. yeah, so. So um, just thinking about actually who that illness affects. The beginning, right? So people know the presenting signs and symptoms for the illness and then what the typical diagnostic testing is and then how the plot unfolds, thinking about the treatment, the time course, the prognosis. And these are the things really as um, providers that we are also discussing with patients so that they know what to expect. So all important um, aspects of our fund of knowledge to build for each illness. So then moving on to problem representation. Um, 
Who here, just raise your hand, is familiar with the term problem representation? This is like a show of hands. Yeah, so we talked about it yesterday. Um, so problem representation, this is really the one-liner. Um, and the idea is that as someone is going through a presentation, or even just um, as we're framing in our minds and sort of focusing in and out of different parts of that person's presentation, um, you, so I use this um, to say uh, decision making is a muscle, right? And so people who are really good at decision making, and that's a big part of clinical reasoning, saying what do I think is going on? It's a muscle you have to exercise. And so that's why we're always telling people who are starting out, like it's important to put your nickel down. It's important to decide what you think is happening. And as you form the problem representation or sort of like that assessment and plan one liner, you as the provider are deciding like, what is actually important about that person's background that contributes to why they're here in the hospital or why they're being treated for a particular condition. So the problem representation for every patient should answer three questions. Okay. Who is the patient? Like what are their risk factors? What is the temporal pattern of the illness that they have currently? And then what is the clinical, like what clinical syndrome is it consistent with? Um, and we are going to exercise, so at the last uh, conference that we did on this, we exercised a little bit about making our own one-liners um, and problem representations, and we'll do that again today for this patient. So the idea, the way I think about this is if your brain is a file box and has a whole bunch of files lined up, and each of those files is an illness script, then the purpose of the problem representation is to activate the illness script. Right, it's so that someone says to you, "Oh, this is a patient, um, you know, presenting with certain, like, let's say, with a history of injection drug use, presenting with like subacute and a weight loss and fever, um, with, uh, you know, consistent with acute HIV or whatever." But the idea is that if you hear the first part of the one-liner before the consistent with, then anybody listening to that one-liner can say, "Oh, I know." Because that activated for me and sort of, and I think of like the file like lighting up and someone takes it out and then they can actually read the illness script and figure out what's going to happen. Um, okay, and then just looking over diagnostic schema. So di saying the words diagnostic schema is essentially like a fancy way of saying what is my approach to this problem. And um, there's a thought about how to teach clinical reasoning, but one of them, um, and this is sort of the one I ascribe to, is that as internal medicine, as sort of providers in internal medicine, what do we do? Like, I rarely cut anything open. I rarely do procedures. I just like sit and think about stuff. And if we're teaching other people how to think about stuff, then it may be to their benefit in terms of hitting the broadest number of learners um, to actually break it down in a systematic way. And so, um, so for diagnostic schema, this is what is your structured approach to a problem? And these, um, so this book, Teaching in the Hospital, he has a whole section, and it's essentially just diagnostic schema for common presentations in hospital medicine. So looking at AKI, right, we say this all the time, is it pre-renal, intrinsic, or post-renal? Looking at dyspnea, things like the dyspnea pyramid are sort of advanced uh, diagnostic schema. And then MISO is one I use for altered mental status. But. And then, uh, but so acronyms, just things to help you not forget uh, different possible diagnoses. And then looking at, just remembering that many schema can exist for one problem. People can make up their own schema, really just whatever is going to be helpful to learners. So an example I always give with this is, we learn in medical school, right, microcytic, normocytic, macrocytic anemia. I think in practice that is like helpful in some ways, but not always. Um, so what I often do is I say, well, their hemoglobin's low. Are they losing blood, destroying blood? Are they not making it, or are they hiding it somewhere? Um, and just thinking about ways that you can, in a structured way quickly go through a diagnostic, um, like a differential diagnosis, it seems. So now, so that was just a couple of minutes. Uh, before we move on, any questions on those three concepts? So illness script, problem representation, and diagnostic schema? Okay. So we're going to um, take it to the words. This is in England somewhere a very long time ago. So this is not our words, but it's close enough. So I'm, I'm going to lead you guys through this case. It is a little complicated and long. And some of you may have met this patient. Um, so if you have, try and play along. But, so BN is a 33-year-old man with a history of alcohol use. Recurrent pancreatitis sort of has been hospitalized a couple of times, but has never had severe pancreatitis, usually just a couple of days of hydration then goes home. Um, presenting as a transfer from an outside hospital where he initially presented with abdominal distension. 
there's like a lot of places we could go from that, so I'm going to give you guys more information just in the interest of time. So he says that around mid-June 2018, so he was sort of living his life, feeling pretty normal, he noticed two weeks of progressive abdominal distension, and mostly just that his pants fit more tightly. So it wasn't that he was, like, gravid appearing, but just noticed things were a little off. And then had fatigue and some mild shortness of breath. He says before that, no clear illnesses, no fever, chills, nausea, emesis, weight loss, no change in his alcohol use. He's drinking about eight ounces of whiskey a day for about 10 years. Just a, rounding out his other history, he really has no other history other than pancreatitis. His social history, um, not significant. He's employed as a surgical tech, um, but no history of illicits, uh, no history of incarceration, time in shelter, um, sort of lives at home with his fiance. Um, his family history, he says he's not really sure, but as far as he knows, like, no significant medical issues. And then he's monogamous with one partner. Oh, sorry. Um, just some objective data to get us started. Uh, so at the admission to the outside hospital, his labs were essentially normal. He had a normal CBC. His BMT just has a mild hyponatremia and normal renal function. And then his LFTs were normal, but he had an INR of 1.4. His amylase was 254 and lipase 449. And then he had a, they did a serum alcohol level that was negative, and he had a BNP done that was less than 10. So then he undergoes a diagnostic para at the outside hospital. And it's found to, it's described as being turbid. It's, he's found at 800 white blood cells with 81% neutrophils and 72% mice. 76,000 red blood cells, a total protein of 3.2, glucose of 71, triglycerides of 44, and then an amylase in the fluid of 4,900, um, and albumin 2.1. And cultures are drawn at that point, and they're negative, and he has like an AF, it's not an ADA, but it's like an AFB from that fluid scent, which is negative. So, and then just this stat is 1.1. And then he gets some hepatitis through all these HIV stuff, which are negative. He has like a long, complicated course, which I'm giving all of this to you up front. Um, so then he has some imaging done right when he gets there. And they he had an ultrasound of the abdomen and then a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. It shows steatosis in the liver, but no cirrhosis, a right pleural effusion. Um, they said like mild or a small amount of ascites and then instantly, incidentally noted bilateral lower lobe PEs. And he has a TTE like right after, which is also normal. So then things get really complicated, and this is still at the outside hospital. So he undergoes what's described as many parasympesis. He said he lost count, mostly which were therapeutic in nature because he just has this recurrent abdominal obsession that reaccumulates quite quickly. And then, on, so he's admitted there June 28th. On July 5th, he becomes profoundly hypotensive, drops his hemoglobin, and is intubated and goes to the ICU at the other hospital. And then a CTA shows a grade 4 splenic laceration versus just splenic rupture. Bilateral pleural fusions that are much bigger than prior, and hemo evidence of hemoperitoneum, which had previously been seen as simple as sightings on the CT. So he undergoes embolization of the splenic artery. And then in this setting, his UVT prophylaxis is held. And then he had been on, um, he had been on, I think enoxaparin or something for the UVT. And then has a lower extremity ultrasound that shows an acute non-occlusive DVT of the common femoral, femoral, popliteal veins in the left lower extremity. And they put him on a heparin drip so they can stop it quickly. And his PTT does not move. They're like going up and up and up on the heparin drip. And he has his, they couldn't get it above 30. So then on the 11th, he <laughs> essentially becomes septic. And he becomes, he has high fevers. His heart rate goes into the 120s. His leukocytosis rises into the mid-20s. And at this point, um, they're looking for evidence, like, where is the infection? They're doing more parasympteses. They do a thora, which now shows 700 cc's of dark brown fluid. And then cytology with inflammatory mesothelial cells has a one final uh, CT scan that shows massive ascites. And everything else is, um, it also shows um, his spleen was essentially, like, broken into many pieces and is um, sort of, in a mess in his left upper quadrant. Um, and then, and that's really it. And then, so just as a, a short recap, so it's antibiotics at the outside hospital, essentially like when he gets hypertension, they <clears throat> start him on empiric coverage. And he has had some combination of like neurotenum, cetriaxone, cefepine, 
uh, IV vancomycin, PO vancomycin, mycofungin. And so then he arrives here. And so this brings us like up to the present day. So he's had a lot of stuff happen. I'm going to put all this stuff up on the board again. So when he gets here, he is, his heart rate is like stuck in the 130s. His blood pressure is sort of initially is 120s over 80s. He gets a little more hypotensive. He's spiking high fever just like constantly saturating while we're there. And then he is extremely pickactive with um, evidence of tent abdominal dissension and an enormous abdomen. And anasarca, he has, his entire body is, has so much anasarca, he actually has two plus edema all the way up to the nipple line. So he has like on his back, on his front, everywhere is, is like very edematous. No rashes, no sigma of liver disease. And then has a, his white count on arrival to us, white count of 23, hemoglobin 8, platelets of 833. His BMP is like pretty normal. He's a little bit of AKI. Um, LFT is as here, so transaminase with ALC of 104, ASD 139, total billy 1.6, algorithm 1.6, LFOS of 294, and then like a okay -ish. Okay, so we're going to do a little pair share. So this is a lot, and I'm going to put all that information back up on the board, but so your intern gives you a one liner. That is essentially the entire hospital course. Essentially says like this person presented and here's all the things that happened to them. If you are listening to that presentation and I want you to share with like a person next to you, how do you think you could distill it down for your team into a concise problem representation? So who is this patient? What is the temporal pattern of their illness with presenting signs and symptoms? And um, and what do we think the clinical syndrome is that he has? And this is very hard, right? Because he's very complex and a lot of habits. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take like two to three minutes. And I want you guys to just share with the person next to you how you would. So like you're, and remember, it's just that your intern has started to present to the team and it's like all over the place. And you are like, I can teach this. Let's organize our thoughts. So how would we do it? <laughs> Um, no one knows. They think so. That no one actually knows. He had multiple paras, and he had one like in the the one that's the closest to the spleen he had was like all the way down here. But they thought maybe someone hit the spleen. But it, even if they hit the spleen with a needle. I mean, it like exploded. Yeah. Or like, uh, 
more seconds. Seems like some people are still talking, but... <laughs> comes in with an episode of what looks like pancreatitis with new onset ascites with a course that's progressively worsened ascites anasarca complicated by hyperly iatrogenic splenic rupture and recurrent sepsis. Yeah, I think that's really good. Okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, there's no, so there's no right answer. Oh, wait, oh, I meant to say stop. Did you say sepsis or serves? You said sepsis. You said sepsis. Yeah, you said recurrent sepsis, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, but I think, well, I mean... we have this new oral fluid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there was SPP or something. <clears throat> or, or not SPP. Uh, not SPP, but like secondary. Secondary. Yeah. Yeah, never mind. So, okay. So then the next question is, now we have our one-liner. Um, and that helps us organize, like, our problem list and work up. So, like, what are the diagnostic schema that, you know, we think would be useful in thinking about how to work them up? Like, where do we go from here? Um, and so that can be just like major diagnoses that you would organize a workup around or um, or sort of ways that you would help your team break it down. So now we actually have to stop again. Sorry. This is an additional fair share. And then I'll tell you about some of the ones that we tried to use and then I'll fill you in on sort of how we present it from here. But I, uh, yeah. Uh, it's like what algorithm? Yeah, exactly. You need to know what these things are. I want like a little protein clamp. Let's try the sag and see if we can put it into a way. Yeah, it's like what algorithm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, is this is how you use the like, really so, uh, is it more is it more related to you know is it a bicyclic protein to cardiac cells? Is it is it is it is it like TB? Does it have a weird chemistry? Those are the things that. Right. 
I invite the RE1 look just like cardiac facilities on the blue area. So, uh, those are those are interesting. Just for the it would. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the other bush is why is this guy not Think about does he have new onset of uh, Things that came up for our team is like, just what are causes of peritonitis, right? It seems like he has some sort of irritation in his peritoneum that was present even when he first got there. So, what are the causes of peritonitis? And that sort of split, he was sort of treated empirically for like question mark SBP, but had like a much more inflammatory uh, set of peritoneal studies. What about um, so non serotic portal hypertension? I think that that gets missed a lot, but the question, or not missed, but it, it's something that doesn't come up so much for us. Um, but our question was like, why did he rupture his spleen? And he was never in a car crash. We were talking about his trauma history. Like the only way to do that is if someone has like very bad portal hypertension, usually, and then something happens, you may be at higher risk. But even if like they hit it, so the question was like, did someone hit it with a para? But even if you hit someone's spleen with a needle, it shouldn't like break into seven pieces. Like. Wait, but wasn't that after the IR intervention that the spleen ruptured? Uh, well, he had imaging before the IR intervention where it said showed splenic rupture. Oh, so it happened before the IR thing. So yeah, so he had a grade four laceration uh, with splenic rupture, and then after the splenic, after the embolization, then it looked even worse and sort of fragmented more. Oh, okay. I thought that was purely iatrogenic because of the IR thing, but it, I didn't realize it happened. After. Yeah, and so, um, and then so causes of, but thinking about causes of non-traumatic portal hypertension, like did he have something else going on? before all this started and started to have some portal hypertension, started to have some ascites, and then came in and all this terrible stuff happened. Hypercoagulable state, right? Like, why does he have PEs? Why does he develop, like, a DVT within two days of being a floor? Why doesn't his PTT buzz, which we can talk about, like, the differential for that, but um, sort of, like, all interesting to consider if that's all contributing. And then just even, like, we talked about this workup of Anasarca, right? So he has, like, no nephrotic range proteinuria. He was, like, very impressively... For someone who is that cachectic, the degree of anisarcal is very impressive. Um, so these were all just like things that we played around with. And then the way that I like to think about it is like then diagrams, right? So to say like, okay, well, I know what the workup for nuance set ascites is. I know what that differential is. Like, how does that interact with like a hyperplugable state? How does that interact with the differential for anisarca? Um So how would you proceed? Just for time, we're going to keep going. So I'll just tell you how we proceeded. Um, I think probably a lot of people would phone a friend. Um, so that is what we phoned a couple of friends. So what our team did. Um, so when he was admitted, he had worsening sepsis. We actually did a bedside <coughs> ultrasound with the bedside ultrasound that for sure he didn't have. And um, 
the it looked terrifying it looks like just like bubbles everywhere and i was like are these horrible loculations what are we looking at he came on a saturday the imaging couldn't be uploaded during the weekend um and then he had multiple he had pl like pretty sizable plural fusions on both sides that were all septated so um then the question was like okay well we don't think it's really safe to tap at bedside we couldn't even tell what anything was under there it's very unclear like what was bell and what wasn't so we ended up doing a repeat ct chest abdomen pelvis he essentially got like much worse at one point and we said okay we can't wait for imaging we'll just do a repeat ct um so this is what it showed <laughs> right so this is all exciting and IR was like, no, but you could just like throw a needle at it, just let it drain out. But at bedside, the ultrasound looked so strange. Like none of, there was no black anywhere on any part of his abdomen. Um, and then this is what it looked like in here. So it's a little hard to see, but like his pancreas is around here. This is actually some of the hematoma from the splenic rupture. Um, and this is his bowel, also a little dilated. Okay, so, so then we ended up getting IR to do a, IR guided diagnostic para. Um, we ended up just telling them to take off as much as they could. <clears throat> sort of weren't really sure if that was the right decision. The study showed white blood cell count of this is in the in the ascites fluid, 128,000 white blood cells, 212 red blood cells, and then an amylase of 17,000, um, which is something that I have almost never seen before. Um, and then cultures were still negative. We ended up getting an MRCP. Um, this sort of, if you read the notes, it seems like the liver team came up with it, but not exactly. So um, <laughs> <laughs> so they were concerned about a pancreatic pleural fistula as the etiology for his like dark brown fluid from the pleural space at the outside hospital. Um, so we ended up getting an MRCP, and it was really interesting. What we were looking for was, we didn't really know what we were looking for. We were like, maybe we'll get a better look at the liver. Maybe he really does have cirrhosis, the CT is wrong, and that ultrasound is was poorly done, and yet, like we had, but it ended up showing actually a very large peripancreatic collection that was obscured by the artifact from the clips. So like these other CTs had been done, and nobody could see. There's actually like this big cystic structure right in between the pancreas and the stomach, and nobody could see it because of the streak artifact from the clips from the embolization. It was there before. It's not. It was not there before, and even we had our radiologists finally on Monday like review the imaging from the outside hospital, and they said that it's just like something about the views. Like it, maybe it was smaller. That part, like just the resolution on CT, or I guess like the area just behind the pancreas, maybe wasn't as good. Like they don't really know why, but they don't see the same collection there. Or maybe it just got worse. Um. So then, uh, we tried to like be bold and de-escalate his antibiotics because all of his cultures have been negative actually for the entire time he's been in any hospital. Um, but that didn't work. And then uh, we had a discussion with GI surgery, liver, and IV, um, just to think about, is there anything else we could be missing? And then given his poor nutritional status and being a poor operative candidate, he was placed on PPN, and we decided to try to medically manage. My concern was like, does he need a washout? He has all these blood products in his abdomen. He maybe at some point had a bug in there. Maybe if someone did hit his thing with a needle, they also had a small enterotomy. Like very hard to know. And all of are all of the diagnostic studies ever since his very first one had all been done on antibiotics. So hard to know maybe the yield is worse. Um, and so, and then we added octreotide, which um, I'll, we'll talk about why we did that. And he ended up actually having multiple um, endoscopic procedures and multiple attempts at ERCP to get a good look at the pancreatic death. Um, and we'll talk about why. And he ended up getting a cystogastrostomy, which is essentially they go into the stomach they ultrasound and try and figure out where the cyst is, and then they just stick like a straw in between them, and they let it all drain out. And then a necrosectomy, which is they take out dead tissue. So they actually go into the cyst, like periscope around, suck out all the stuff they see that looks necrotic, and they think is making someone sick. Um, and actually, he's really, with this combination, <laughs> he looks great. Tell, am I wrong? He's, he's maybe skinnier than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Okay, he's still very good, but he <laughs> looks much better than I met him. And so, so we essentially just medically managed his um, his ascites, which we'll talk about, like what we thought it was, and just continued to drain it. Kept him on antibiotics with the hope that it was sort of like a quasi washout, um, because he's just a really poor surgical candidate because of his poor nutrition. Um, put the cystogastrostomy in place, 
And then um, he's actually done really well. And he's been off Miro kind of for like four days or five days. Um, and then unfortunately he then developed candidorous anemia. What? Almost all of the Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's like extremely motivated. He's walking around. He's trying to gain weight. He's like asking for protein powder to put on his food. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's. Is that where he got? Is GI having a lot of soda? Is what? Is GI having him drink a lot of soda? Uh, I've had one of these like right. Cescastros and Aiden Eckhart psych many patients before. Yeah, GI tells him to yeah, drink like soda to like break down the yeah, stuff that's like being broken. Yeah. 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 yeah, like yeah. break down the stuff so, that's coming out of this. So we thought at the end of this that the final diagnosis was actually pancreatic ascites. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that is. So that's its own diagnosis. It's fairly mm -hmm. rare. But related to chronic pancreatitis, then with secondary peritonitis and splenic rupture due to traumatic paracentesis. Um, so what became of the symptomology? Yeah, so um, so it turns out that the differential diagnosis for like a non-budgetable PPT, that's probably a smarter way of saying that, but um, is not is not yes, thank you, a refractory <laughs> PPT is not. Uh, it's actually not that big, and it's mostly um, an anti-thrombin three deficiency. So we sent testing for antifrombin 3 deficiency, but there's actually a proportion of patients where the assay doesn't pick it up for whatever reason. Either they have like a slightly different mutation or... So um, it came back within normal limits, but the thought is he probably has some type of antifrombin 3 deficiency and isn't uh, amenable to heparin. Over the course of these things, he actually ended up getting an IVC filter because he was on Fonda Paranox and it kept getting interrupted. Um, and so we are very carefully keeping track of the... Well, now Tyler is keeping track of the IVC filter. Um, and then he'll be on a DOAC, and then he'll have some metallic follow-up. But he's never had a blood clot before. It's just thought that like maybe all of this is in the setting of, yeah. And then he may undergo like a workup for hypercoagulability, but he's yeah. But the pain is a lot. Like the pain found out that they found out when he just went to the hospital. Well, I don't think they know if it's a cure product, and like I think just the sensitivity of that of just a regular CT. Like angio for chronic pee is not usually very good, so I think we assumed that it was new, but they were small when they were first found. And then he had in the setting hold, like holding anticoagulation. I would say probably because he was on like a heparin product before they probably just was never on anticoagulation, and then they found this bigger DVT. So he's not thinking. So is there a thought of giving him like an anticoagulation instead of an antitrust? Um. Yeah, he so he, so initially what happened was he actually was eating okay as soon as we drained. So really interesting, we drained the ascites, took five liters off, and he just, because we were like, why does he have such bad ascites? He doesn't have nephrotic range area. He has a low albumin, but it's like relatively new. His heart is fine. His kidneys are fine. His liver is fine. Like his liver function is good. Um, and we, I think a lot of it was probably just compression of the IVC from the ascites because as soon as we drained it, then all of a sudden he just like mobilized all that fluid and now he's like has no edema at all. We also like did some aggressive LASIK stuff, but um, so um, we didn't think about NJ2 because I think I don't actually have a good reason. I don't know why. I don't think he would have been. It seems like it's recommended to use a new nutrition for that. Yeah. Um, and then you want to put the epigenic on slight to remain and then you can able to see or as a result of the Yes, I think that that's probably true. Uh, in retrospect, that would have been maybe a wiser decision. You don't do injuries now. Well, the thought was he was only going to need it for like a couple of days. Okay. Yeah. Um, because he, he had like an episode of quasi pancreatitis while he was here and then he sort of got better from that. And then he was eating. Not, I think not at the outside hospital. I think they just were like, this is really confusing. We don't know what it's from. Yeah, well, it's like borderline. So the sagamal one. So I think people were sort of like, it could be, yeah, it's like hard to know. Uh, but that's actually typical. We'll talk about it. It's typical for pink assays. So I just thought it'd be good to just build for all of us like an illness script. This is a rare diagnosis, but actually it's more and more commonly recognized. So actually it was first um, diagnosed only in 1953, so it's not that old. Um, and there are no randomized control trials looking at the treatment of pancreatic ascites. And the data we have comes from 
there's like a review article from like 1975 where they tried to look at I don't know it's from sorry it's from 2003 but they try to look back since 1975 when the first like full course of treatment was described and they just look at anything described in the literature and like make their own trial and they're like well based on all of this stuff which is every documented case we could find this is what we think might be this. So pathophysiology is often found um, when someone has non-malignant pancreatic disease, there's an accumulation of acidic fluid secondary to leakage of pancreatic secretions from some sort of ductal disruption with or without pseudocyst. And the thought is that in, con in chronic pancreatitis, there's some fibrous post-inflammatory changes to this issue, in particular around the pancreatic duct, and it becomes more fragile. And like essentially, if there's any sort of blockage, it, the pancreatic juice follows like the path of least resistance, and it just like breaks out the side of the pancreas. <laughs> And like into the acidic fluid. So the epidemiology is actually two to one uh, men to women, and more common in ages 20 to 50, and in pancreatitis secondary to alcohol. So he was like the perfect person to have this disease. And then it's typically a story of like subacute weight loss and increase in abdominal growth and abdominal discomfort, but not necessarily severe pain, um, which is kind of surprising that like your pancreatic juices are like essentially digesting your inside. <laughs> anyway, and then the testing that's typical is high amylase and acidic fluid, and usually greater than 1,000 um, is at least more sensitive. And SAG is often intermediate or low, so um, which sort of makes sense. And then treatment-wise, so um, when they look at all these cases, the people who get conservative treatment, which is considered parenteral nutrition, somatostatin analogs to decrease pancreatic secretion, and then paracentesis, there's a 50% failure rate and actually a fairly high mortality rate. Um, but now, more recently, there's a lot more endoscopic work being done, and so by ERCP, people can have a transcapillary stent, or surgery, actually, like a distal pancreatectomy, versus, like, the cysto, I said, like, GI tract connection, like, either gastrostomy, jejunostomy, or duodenostomy, depending on where the, um, the closest thing is, um, is thought to have, like, a higher success rate, and the, I, but the ideal treatment is unclear, um, and I think in him, it was really complicated because we were still like, well, does he actually, like, did he ever actually have secondary peritonitis from whatever happened, and does he actually need a wash because of that? Um, so just, sorry, to recap learning points, I went a little over time. Just remember, so this is a rare diagnos diagnosis. It was just like an interesting course and a nuanced uh, management plan. And then just thinking about pitfalls of imaging, like, we were so shocked to, like, go, we went down to radiology to look at all of these. And in looking through it, when we realized, like, the actual problem was, at least on our first imaging, mm -hmm. he had this huge cyst, and we just couldn't see it because of the street guard back. Um, and just, like, there was a lot of interdisciplinary care going along the way, especially as, like, teams changed over. Um, and just sort of, it helped diversity to back on, so I like our team. Um, anyway. Any questions? That's all. Yeah. So who ruptured his spleen? <laughs> no one knows. So actually, the other thought is like in the setting of pancreatic, people can develop like essentially, people can have a, I forget the exact thing, but it's like in the setting of his pancreatic inflammation, this, this I guess there is a risk of splenic rupture. Oh, so it could have been splenic. Maybe. I don't know. I've never seen that happen before, but. Yeah, and then also like the we could see the needle mark, yeah. and <laughs> oh, there were explained less. No, it was not that close. Oh, so right. anyway, okay. yeah. 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 yeah.